Welcome to Library Land Conversations. I'm Adam Zan, the president of the Library Land Project. And I'm Greg Pembrolconti, the executive director of the Library Land Project. We're here with another installment of Library Land Conversations. These interviews have been a fascinating way for us to learn about what's happening in librarians and librarianships in all its many forms. And this one's going to be fun. We're really excited uh, to be speaking to Aloida Garcia Febo. Uh, you'll learn more about her, but a, a little bit of a kind of bio. She's a Puerto Rican American librarian. She's a library consultant. Um, Loida served on the governing board of the International Federation of the Library Association for if several so. years. Say again. If if so. if. if if it's a tongue twister and she was a member of the executive board of the ALA uh, from 15 to 2020 and she was a board member president um, she's also been a president of the national association to promote library and information services to Latinos in Spanish-speaking um, populations and that's called reforma and I guess lastly you know over to you Greg for get us started okay thanks Adam Lloyd, it is a real pleasure to, to meet you. Um, you know, Raypon made the suggestion and uh, obviously we, we decided that made a lot of sense. So uh, thank you for agreeing to meet with us. Uh, we're excited to hear about your views on librarianship and what you're seeing out in the, in the, in the world of library land. Yeah, so thank you again. And, and I gave a little bit of a bio, but I guess I'd rather start with, from your words, um, how did your library career begin? Where did this all start? Well, first of all, um, I appreciate the invitation to converse about libraries and, and library workers and um, the work I've done as well. Uh, my career started in Puerto Rico. I started as an elementary school librarian while I was studying for my master's in, in library and information sciences at the University of Puerto Rico. And so from as an elementary school librarian, from there I went to the University of Puerto Rico to work at a, as a special librarian at a unit for persons with disabilities. And uh, that unit was very special because um, we lend devices to students with special needs according to their needs. And we catalog objects and it was really fun in that sense. And then from there, I became the chief of the unit hosting that uh, special uh, uh, library. And then I moved to, and then eventually I moved to um, New York to work at Queens Library. When, when so was I that? Mean, your your uh, move to at, at elementary school. When was your move to New York? To Queens, to New York. It was in two thousand. Yes, fall of two thousand. So this this fall now in November will be uh, uh, twenty years. It's <laughs> exciting. Yes, you've served in in a lot of capacities. You know obviously the president of the ALA. Um, what are roles that you've had have appealed to you the most and, and which have had the greatest impact? Well, I, um, yes, I've, I've, I've had the fortune of being involved in many projects and also serve to uh, the library um, community worldwide and national as well. One of the things I really treasure were the, was the opportunity to establish a group for new librarians worldwide, and is the IFLA, New Professionals, and that I established in 2004. It welcomes librarians, new librarians from all over the world. Uh, the purpose is to engage them in library association work, work, but it also gives them an opportunity to network globally, to uh, collaborate, with others uh, worldwide, uh, coordinate projects. So um, they are influencing librarianship worldwide, uh, even if they are new librarians. So I really treasure that. And then the, the one that I think has, has uh, the most impact in the world 
because I work at, at you know, world level as well, um, is uh, the opportunity that I had to advocate for libraries on behalf of IFLA at the United Nations to um, support uh, culture, advocate for uh, support for culture, education, access to information, and um, ICTs, which is information and communication technologies. And from that work, working as a team with global librarians, we were able to secure access to information on the United Nations uh, Sustainable Development Goals that are goals used by countries worldwide to guide their sustainable um, and developing efforts. They dedicate infrastructure and budget to this. So um, it was an amazing experience. I did that for several years and I'm still connected to the uh, sustainability work. Um, so um, yes, th those are really uh, special to me. We've, we've talked about sustainability on previous uh, podcasts. I, I just wanted to throw in a question, like can you help people sort of understand the scope of what sustainability is? Yes, um, in terms of the, the, the UN Sustainable Development Goals are set to help individuals uh, with their uh, improve their prospects in life, uh, better the education and uh, equity and so on. So it's all about improving someone's uh, prospects in life. Uh, in terms of, let's say, the, the concept of sustainability is very important because it impacts all areas in an individual's life. And, um, you know, the, the human life, also the planet, nature, uh, life above water, life underwater. And so uh, we need to be very mindful of that. And that is in very simple terms because um, I teach classes about this. Uh, but um, if we want to continue uh, joining the planet, joining nature, join, uh, enjoying you know, each other companies, we need to uh, preserve our planet. We need to work towards more equity to a better education, eradicate hunger, uh, more sustainable cities, industries, and so on. And so there are 17 goals and I'm very happy to uh, share with everybody that, that didn't know that access to information, what libraries do, providing that access, helping to ind individuals to understand um, uh, the, the information they are receiving, to analyze it and to use it. It's very important because it impacts all areas of our lives. It's interlinked, interconnected, to uh, everything on the planet and um, like I said in the, the United Nations says above water and underwater. That's, that's awesome. Um, I'm wondering uh, another campaign we read about I think it's related is your libraries equal strong communities campaign. I, w I wonder if you could share uh, an overview of that and sort of what made that effort special. Yes, um, that that was a really special effort, as you mentioned. I love communities. And um, my national library tour was uh, a tour to advocate for libraries. And the stops were mainly at public libraries. I wanted to connect with community members, with leaders, with library patrons to encourage them to support libraries. Uh, the campaign and the tour were really an advocacy effort was a massive effort. I always thank uh, the thousands of librarians across the nation that supported it and worked for it to happen and also the ALA staff. Um, I saw a renewed interest in supporting libraries and also in communities in caring about the other. And that was really heartwarming. Um, some very special uh, proofs of the support for libraries were um, proclaims from, for instance, the governor of Massachusetts supporting libraries and declaring that day the day of uh, libraries equal strong communities. Um, also proclaims came from the city of Seattle, uh, North Miami as well. And um, even in North Miami, the uh, month long celebration of uh, Black Heritage Month in February of 2019 was dedicated to uh, the, the theme was playing with the words of libraries equal strong communities. So that was really telling of their support for libraries. Um, I went to Los Angeles City Hall to advocate for libraries and speak at City Hall. It was very interesting because right 
I was right after the item of, of approving a star for the Hollywood uh, Walk of Fame for a, for a celebrity. So that was very interesting. And um, I also went to the European Union Parliament during the, the tour um, to advocate for libraries at an event uh, of library advocacy that uh, librarians had there at the uh, parliament. So in general, the tour covered about 17 visits in eight countries, not only was in the States. And um, something very beautiful is that when I was in the tour and we will send the news release to different media outlets, um, that was super, super well received. So I went to the TV, to radio, to podcasts, uh, newspaper, magazines. They were all very interesting in libraries and what libraries were doing for communities. Uh, so in total, we had um, about uh, more than 200 mentions during the, the tour times. And um, by January, um, as you say, June 2019, we had more than, um, reached more than 56 million consumers. And so by now I'm sure there's more because the recordings are leaving alive on the ALA website and also on the TV stations and so on. Um, that was an unprecedented effort from ALA. I know that my um, the people that came after me, the presidents had great ideas. We know the pandemic happened, uh, but um, that can tell also what libraries, librarians, working in a concerted effort can do and that there is great support for libraries out there as well. That's so exciting. And um, you, know, you can just feel the energy that you had during those those trips. Um, you know, as you know, we, we travel to libraries, but I don't think we can um, count all those countries and all those cities. That's that's Not awesome. Yet. Yeah, <laughs> we're getting there. So one one more question, I'll hand it over to Greg, but so all your travels and your experience with libraries, you know, what do you think, are there any just huge misunderstandings that you think people have about libraries, you know, or just things you wish the public understood? Um, yes, I will say that uh, one of the biggest things for me is that it's important for communities to understand that library services are free. And this is very interesting. There are many people that yes, come from other countries where library services aren't free. So we are very fortunate here in the USA, uh, but there are other bunch of people uh, that are uh, born and raised here in this country that um, for some reason are not totally aware that library services are free. And this is so beautiful because through these services, for instance, my friends, love to receive their books in their tablets or their uh, different devices they have, even their phones to read while they are in the subway, because I live in New York, or in the bus or somewhere waiting for someone. And that is so amazing because they can um, have a book, you know, in their, in their devices to learn how to cook for a loved one or learn some information, some skills they need that might help them to find jobs, uh, information to know more about health conditions. And so to me, it's very important to encourage people to visit their library physically, if it's open. We know that the pandemic is still going, you know, these different measures, but also they can uh, visit their website of their neighborhood library and learn more about their services. I think that's the first big step to uh, know more about libraries. And then knowing that it's free, and then that there are so many resources as we know, you know, databases, consumer guides to learn, you know, what is the type of air conditioning or heater that you need at your home. Uh, if you're buying a car, you can check that in the consumer guides I went as well. So there are many resources that libraries have they are free, they welcome everybody, and you can find all sorts of services. And if the library doesn't have, let's say, a specific book that you're looking for, many libraries have interlibrary loan services and they can link to another library, or maybe they are a system, find it for you in another of their branches. So there is always an alternative for people to uh, find services in libraries. Excellent, excellent, yeah, I mean, it's true. I, I have friends who, even though I talk about libraries incessantly, 
don't realize what they can get at a public library. Uh, that awareness is critical. Uh, I wonder if we can kind of zoom out a little bit and, you know, are there some sort of meta level issues that libraries face? I mean, as we come out of COVID, I've heard folks talk about uh, people coming out of the habit of going to the library in person or people really loving curbside. And so, you know, are, are there some sort of structural changes that you see happening? Yes, um, there is um, the switch, the massive switch that happened from in-person to virtual. And so many libraries have faced that. Um, not all libraries have good access to the internet, you know, broadband and the speed and all that that we need. So um, besides the, the um, kind of like the issue of li uh, library patrons getting used to uh, going maybe online and kind of like mixing it up with, with in-person visits to libraries, there are other really um, uh, big issues that libraries are facing. And I would like to, to mention those that are maybe more infrastructure, but if we don't have we don't find a solution for them, then we, you know, we can't go to the next levels. And it's, for instance, broadband for all is important uh, because um, librarians need that to operate and create resources and library patrons need that to access the information they need. So it's a very interesting set of, of situations there, right? Uh, and then you mentioned uh, getting used to, uh, for instance, not only visiting library in person or, or uh, using it online, but also accessing materials online. And so libraries sometimes can't provide that services because there are some copyright matters, for instance, licensing of materials or exorbitant prices for eBooks. And so we have the, the public uh, trying to get used to get more online if they have the devices and the access. And then you have libraries at the same time advocating and working towards providing those resources online. So it's kind of like a two sides uh, issues that I'm seeing uh, in terms of the, the issues that face libraries, right? Because they're trying to serve our communities and trying to access resources to do that. Um, and then we have... Uh, uh, you know, what are the resources that people are accessing? And this is this is touching the part of misinformation, um, you know, the mistruth and, and things like that, uh, that librarians are providing guides to information with facts where they can learn more about health conditions or the climate or all the things. And then the library users are also facing this, all this, these decisions, right? What are they going to read? Do they read something that the friend uh, um, recommended that they heard uh, in the store they go at the daily? Or do they read uh, materials that are in the list of, of guides that librarians prepare that say, well, this comes from the World Health Organization or uh, you know, from authorities? So it's a very interesting and complex area. And you asked, so I'm, I'm going in, in all these areas because it's important to know that it's, it's not very simple, right? And then the last issue will be something like climate action, right? Uh, people are faced with that. I live in New York. Uh, about a month ago, there was a big uh, rain in New York. It was only an hour. The subways were flooded. Uh, people there were actually waterfalls in the subway. It was incredible. It had never happened before. Some few people died as well. And so what that tell us, climate is changing, cities are not prepared. How are we helping the community with that? Is the community ready? Are they getting used to that sense that can rain for an hour and cause a total debacle? So uh, there are many issues, there are meta level challenges as you call them, and they're not very simple, but libraries are here to help communities and work together with private and public agencies to try to find solutions for these matters. Excellent, excellent. Um, you, you touched on information and you know, free and equitable access to information and information literacy, those are, those are critical skills. Um, Back in 2016, you wrote that the role of libraries and librarians is essential to the information ecosystem. 
to help provide citizen participation, social inclusion, positivism, and hope. Totally agree. And we're in like, it feels like we're in worse straits now than ever. You know, how can libraries and librarians do more to help combat misinformation and disinformation? I'm going to, to answer this from an, an angle I haven't heard yet, but it's very important to me. Um, it's this, I first I want to say that I sincerely believe the, the, the message I had back then is still very true uh, and is very timely as we have uh, seen during the past years as well, you know, since 2016. Um, libraries are providing access to resources where people can read about current issues and access this information, as I mentioned before, read it, analyze it, and you know, decide how to use it, and hopefully for their own good. Um, and then finding solutions, right, that will be helpful for the cities or the regions. And I always like to be aspirational. So it's the city, the region, and the world. Uh, and so uh, libraries, are indeed bringing this, this positivism, this hope with the information they are providing. Um, I believe that, you know, they're helping to dispel myths and, and mistruths. And the, the one point I want to introduce uh, to, through your podcast, is that libraries are contributing to the social capital of cities. And um, we need that. We need, you know, we need people opening doors for others, returning um, lost items to strangers, uh, giving some directions. Um, you know, I'm talking about beneficial actions between people, even if they don't know each other. And there are books that show that. Librarians include that in storytelling, um, in author talks, if there are books that include that through the author talks, that will be shared. Um, and together, perhaps with um, family and faith institutions, libraries can um, impact society that way um, and increase the social capital of cities. And this will be uh, uh, tremendous. We need that so much now. Um, you know, these are the networks and the relationships among the people who live and work in cities, in neighborhoods, in communities that are yeah. enabling society to function effectively and to work in a way that includes some balance and that still help us to be here, enjoying democracy and the country that we have. It's, yeah, it's, it's social powerful. Yeah, so so I, I want to yeah salute the social capital, and also you mentioned earlier how libraries can connect to public agencies. Increasingly, we're seeing that on our travels. I guess I'm wondering, can you give us some specifics about some great collaborations that that you have seen um, between libraries and their communities and serving those needs? Yes, um, libraries are connecting with uh, public and private agencies, right? What is that? <laughs> the public agencies are usually the uh, those from the local government, uh, the mayor's office or the township office. And then we have the private agencies that might be from um, uh, NGOs, non-governmental organizations or corporations. And so for instance, some of the incredible work that is uh, happening currently I can, I can say, um, for instance, I can give you examples uh, from Los Angeles Public Library. They are, uh, they are a, a township or a, I will say a, a city agency. Uh, part of the library works very closely with that city. And the city has an initiative where they are looking for more sustainability in the buildings. And so because Los Angeles Public Library is part of the city, they are having some solar panels that are in, um, helping to power libraries. So that includes sustainability. That's one thing. There are also, um, the, this, this library is also providing referrals for people that are homeless in partnership with city agencies and with some uh, not-for-profits and some NGOs uh, for people that are homeless 
refer us where to find shelters. And then a couple of times per month, they also, some of the libraries, it's not the entire system, but some of the libraries in that area bring in barbers to give haircuts to people and you don't have to be homeless, you just show up. Uh, sometimes they even um, bring four tactile um, showers and people can take showers. Um, and so this is incredible to support the fabric of the city as we know. Uh, so that's one part. And when they have this type of events, they also have referrals for uh, dentists and general doctors. Uh, they have referrals for other type of health situations and they bring uh, pamphlets to uh, bring from the city, but they have them available on tables to give out to those that show up. And during the pandemic, that was very important. Once people could you know, go out and the libraries were open, they had these tables outside and people could pick them up and learn how to stay safe. Um, and so I wanted to mention that because the pandemic has not ended. And so we are still, you know, in, maybe if I live in New York or another kind of big city, we are, Main, uh, mainly, you know, going about our lives now, but there are many pockets in our country that are still experiencing the pandemic very acutely. Uh, I am glad there are not huge pockets, but that's still going on. And so libraries are impacting the community and serving the communities that way. Uh, and so it's very important, you know, because there are areas that are very densely population, even if they are kind of like small for their zip code, but people need to, you know, be reminded very often about, you know, uh, uh, so, uh, physical distancing and washing the hands and all that information. And so libraries are partnering with different organizations to provide accurate information based in science that these health organizations um, have prepared not only in English, but also in different languages. So that's part of the, an amazing work done by libraries. It requires so much time and effort and also passion from these library workers. It's true. There is such passion out there in the library community. It's one of the things that, as Adam said earlier, you know, being on the road again, the chance to meet with people has just been just so, uh, so wonderful. Um, what are you currently working on? Yes. Oh, I'm so fortunate. I get to work on things that really excite me. Um, so recently, I have been collaborating with um, university libraries to bring, uh, embed, help them to embed diversity principles into their strategic planning. And so that's work that really uh, fills me with joy. And, uh, you know, they are, uh, we have, I want to say, we have heard a lot about diversity and that we need that, we need to foster diversity, we need to bring these principles, but there are many, many people that do not know how to start. And so I, the, my most recent uh, work has to do with that, how to help academic libraries start embedding these principles. And also I, I did some, um, I've done some work because I have many parallel projects. So at the same time, I'm working on the same area with diversity, but with a group of librarians um, that want to bring back the conversation to their uh, places of work, which is different from the strategic planning. It could be part of strategic planning, but uh, this other project was, uh, different. And then at the same time, because I have many projects, I just wanted to mention one more, and it has to do with development. And so teaching, I've been teaching internationally on how we can uh, move, how libraries can help cities move forward to um, uh, sustainability and development. That's great. Um, we're, we're winding down time, and I, I had a couple, we usually sort of close these out with asking about favorite library memories, and I feel we didn't touch on Puerto Rico enough during this uh, podcast. Can you, can you share a, a favorite memory, maybe from your youth, and then maybe something uh, later in your travels? Well, I, I, this is awesome. It's just working so nicely, like the universe comes together. Uh, because my one of my favorite uh, memories from public library is reading at my mom's school library in Puerto Rico. And when I was uh, very young, 
uh, the library worked as a public library because there was no public library in that area and there's still no public library. Um, so it was amazing seeing parents and people from the community coming in after school hours. And we were the children of the librarians, so we were there reading as well. So a wonderful community hub. Um, and then my, uh, since, since we mentioned Puerto Rico, I'm going to give an example of my travels, but it's to Puerto Rico. Because when I presided, uh, I was vice president of the American Library Association. Um, something really terrible happened in my island. There was a hurricane. Hurricane Maria devastated the island from coast to coast. And I had the opportunity to go on a library tour to call attention to what happened, to ask the library community worldwide to donate, to, uh, uh, to rebuild libraries in Puerto Rico and also in the Caribbean, Virgin Islands as well, because there were territories of the United States that were impacted by the hurricane. And so we did that, there were articles, there were videos uh, all over and ALA was able to give grants for libraries to start the rebuilding process, thanks to the donations and the generosity of the library community worldwide. Oh, that's awesome. Uh, yeah, I love that. Well, well, this has been wonderful. Uh, wish, wish we could go on even further. Maybe we'll chat to you after we hang up the Zoom. Um, so it's been great meeting you and thanks so much for joining us today. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you for being I, here. I, one question, how, how do people get in touch with you or how would they find you online or, you know? Yes, I am in Twitter. So it's one word, Loida Garcia Fibo. That's my Twitter handle. Uh, if someone is more, I'm also on LinkedIn, Loida Garcia Fibo. If someone is more adventurous and <laughs> wants to send me a direct uh, email, it's uh, Gmail, Loida Garcia Fibo at gmail.com. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, Friends, there are many more library land conversations in store for you, and we'll be back soon to share more. If you have any questions or comments or suggestions for guests, drop us a line at info at librarylandproject.org. And until next time, we'll see you in library land. Library land.